Our gospel lesson this morning is one that was from the lectionary a few weeks ago. We sort of moved things around because we didn't celebrate the Epiphany until last Sunday. But this is the story of the baptism of our Lord. They're okay. That's where they're going to end up anyway. Hi, guys. Hello, Killian. You know you're cute, don't you guys? Hey. We're going to read the story of our Lord's baptism from Luke's Gospel, chapter 3. He's in a hurry. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to, clear the, to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Got too many papers up here this morning. Now, if you know anything about Isaiah, you know that there really were at least three authors who wrote under the name Isaiah. And the lesson we read comes from second Isaiah, which everyone calls the happy Isaiah. This is the Isaiah who wrote when the time of exile in Babylon was coming to an end and restoration was promised to the people that were going to be led back home. It's a book that begins in chapter 40 with those familiar words that sometimes we read at funerals. Comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord your God. Tell them their time of suffering is over. Now, third Isaiah begins much later when the people have already returned, but you've got to remember they returned to Jerusalem to find the temple destroyed. Some of them had not been born there. They'd been born in exile. This was the home of their ancestors, their parents and their grandparents. And that is where we get the verses that probably seem more familiar to us today, maybe, than we would like to think. And they are from the third part of Isaiah, and it says, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. The prophet crying out to God for redemption. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Sam's a little bit closer to what John is saying, right? John, who's out there in camel's hair, eating bugs and honey, screaming, repent to the people. And what does he say about Jesus? But his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, we just read a little short passage from Acts about the Samaritans being baptized. First in the name of Jesus, because the Holy Spirit hadn't come upon them. But you need to take that in the context of the first chapter of Acts, when God is saying, before Jesus ascends, He's saying, you're going to be my witnesses to Samaria and the ends of the earth. You have to understand how much Jews and Samaritans hated each other. Now they're sending people to Samaria so they can be baptized fully with the Holy Spirit as Jesus is baptized with the Holy Spirit. But John is not a happy guy here, is he? He's talking to the people. He says they're a brood of vipers. In the verses we didn't read this morning, he calls them to repent. They're saying, what should we do? To the tax collectors, he said, stop cheating people out of their money. To other people, he said, what shall we do? They said to him, and he said, if you have two coats, give one away to someone who needs one. If you have more food than you need, feed someone. And the people are scared, and they're baptized. So why are we putting these lessons together this morning? Why are we reading from Happy Isaiah, chapter 43? I think it's the line that sticks with me no matter what I hear. This is why I've chosen this passage for my own funeral. It says, I have called you by name, you are mine. And Isaiah 43 is the only chapter in the entire of Scripture, the Jewish Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament, the Christian Bible. This is the only place where God says to the people, I love you. Now, I can't tell you fully what baptism means in our context. I can't tell you why Jesus, who was without sin, came to be baptized. But I can tell you that today we're celebrating the fact that the heavens have opened 
God did not tear them open, but God descended in the bodily form of a dove upon his beloved son, Jesus. So what happens when Jesus is baptized? It's a strange account in Luke's gospel, a little different than the others, because the, we left out some verses this morning. Those are the verses where John has been arrested by Herod and is put in prison. It's before he dies. That's when we hear that Jesus came with all the people. When all the people were baptized, Jesus had also been baptized. He is praying, and the heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit descends on him. And the voice comes from heaven that says, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Now, I said I can't fully explain why it's a sacrament. For United Methodist, baptism is a sacrament, meaning baptism and Holy Communion are the two times when we believe that it is not me. It has nothing to do with me, although I'm ordained and given authority over the sacraments in the church. This is Christ's presence with us. This is God acting. This morning, through my hand, through the water, Christ will baptize these two boys. Bishop Yackel, who ordained me back in 1985 and again in 1988, said to me and said to all of us, never think that your ordination is your status in the church. Your status is your baptism. It's baptism that makes us part of God's family in Jesus Christ. But why would Jesus bother to be baptized if we believe he was without sin? We need to look at the time in which John was baptizing. Not all baptisms were for the renunciation of sin. They weren't always about cleansing from sin. Some were about ritual purification required by the law. But we know that Jesus was one of the people. He was there, fully human, as we say. And he set an example for us, both by presenting himself for baptism and when he prays. Luke's gospel is full of Jesus praying. He's off by himself praying. He prays before he calls his disciples. He prays at the transfiguration the other time that we hear God's voice speaking to him. And Jesus prays, and the Spirit descends and says, You're my son, my beloved. Just as Isaiah said, I have claimed you. I love you. Now, it's about the promise that God makes through the prophet Isaiah. It's a promise, though, that seems kind of hollow these days, doesn't it? When you pass through the fires, you won't be burned. When you go through the waters, you will not be overcome. How many of you heard just this week about the fire in New York that took 19 lives, including all those children? And the country, our country and the world, has been overwhelmed with flooding, and people have lost their lives. This is the kind of thing that keeps some people from faith. They say, why would you believe in a God who would allow these things to happen, especially a God who promises that you will not be hurt? I think the difference is that God is promising here and talking to the people of Israel, and now today to the church saying to us that whatever happens in our lives, God will be with us. Whatever holocaust there is, God will get us through. Whatever destruction and desolation we face, God will be with us. And baptism today is our entrance into that promise that God is claiming us, and we claim the promise, which is why we baptize infants. People say to me all the time, why would your church baptize infants? I mentioned my husband, who was a Southern Baptist, and his mother, when he told her that we were going to get married, he introduced her to the idea of me by saying, Mom, you know how you've always met, wanted me to meet a nice church-going girl? She said, I'm thrilled. He said, she's in church every Sunday of her life, and she said, this is the best thing I've ever heard. And he said, she's so involved in her church, she's there almost every day of the week, and my mother-in-law said, son, I can die a happy woman. I'm so happy to hear this. And then he that he took a breath and said to her, she is an ordained United Methodist clergywoman. And he said, after the silence, his mother said, those people baptize babies. So why would we baptize a baby who cannot claim Christ? We baptize them to say that in Jesus Christ, there is grace abundant. You don't need to be able to understand it at that age. It takes hold of you. And today, Declan and Killian's parents are going to make the promise in his name to raise him in the church to know and love their Savior. And they will do that. I know that. It's our entrance into the promise. And today the congregation will also affirm that you're going to help these parents to raise their children in the knowledge and love of their Lord. Now, today is an interesting day because we only practice communal baptisms. We don't do private baptisms. But we're living in a weird age. So we've got some people here, and we've got people on Zoom this morning, so they're going to get to participate as well. Now, I can tell you what baptism is not. It's not the get-out-of-hell-free card. 
that's what some people think. And some people will call up who have never been in a church before and they'll say, I want to have my kid done. Like, your kid done? Your hair done? You want us to bake them until they're done? What do you mean by done? Dunked. Baptized. And if I ask them why, they say, because I don't want my child to go to hell. This is not about going to hell. God does not punish children. God does not send children to hell because they are not baptized. It's not about that. There was a time when I was an associate pastor. I didn't have much authority over my senior pastor. A family in my congregation, it was a married couple, and their son was married to a woman. Her parents had been killed in a car accident recently, and they had a baby. They were getting ready to move to California. They didn't live in our town, but every time they came, they would come to church, and they wanted to have their baby baptized with his grandparents in our congregation. And my senior pastor said, absolutely not because they have to be members of this congregation. I said, they're not members of any congregation. They want to join a church when they get to California, but that's a little far to commute every Sunday to come here to Frederick, Maryland. And he said, nope, not going to do it. The grandparents were very angry and ended up leaving the church over that. But his grandmother called me one day and said, we're in trouble because in California the baby is desperately ill. He is in the ICU and he needs to be baptized. When someone has a sick child, it's not a teachable moment. You don't say to them, you don't need to be baptized. Your child is safe in God's love and care and grace. But this is back in the day when you could call 911 or not 911, 411 and get information. I called 411 in California. I said, I want every United Methodist Church in Mission Viejo, California. And on the third church, I got a pastor. And I said, one of our children is there and needs you. needs to be baptized. And he got his baptismal kit. And he went. And the parents said they opened the door to the room. And there was a man who was wearing Birkenstocks, what I used to wear back in the day until I was told I needed to wear shoes to be a pastor. They said it was like you if you were a man and had a beard. It was like you being there. Because we are all one church. We're all one body in Jesus Christ. We're all one family, even in our Jewish ancestry. Paul, the apostle, said we are a branch that is grafted onto the tree of the chosen people. And so in that grand scale of Old and the New Testament, we are part of that family. And today these babies will enter into that family as well. Now, I told you I don't know what happens in baptism totally, but I know that Christ is present. I know it's not about me. I think of another baptism that I conducted for a 13-year-old girl named Jana. Jana who was born and became one of the kids with the most severe form of autism. She made a lot of noise in church, and people sometimes looked at her, and they didn't like her being there because they said, why does she have to come? She doesn't know what's going on. I baptized her when she was 13 years old. We didn't sing that song that night, but she had a communicator, and she could sit and she could put puzzles together like nothing you've ever seen. I'm still amazed. Every, and everybody needs a Jana on their VCR because she could sit there without looking at the television while putting a puzzle together, hit rewind, and get it to exactly the right spot every single time. We didn't sing the song, but Jana started typing on her communicator. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got Jana in his hands. Jana in his hands. Jana in his hands. Baptism is God saying, I love you, Jana, just as you are. God is saying, I love you, Terry, even though I know what kind of a mess you're going to make in your life. I love you anyway. God is saying today to these little guys, I love you, Declan, I love you, Killian, and you're going to be part of my family now and forever. Now, I did say that the congregation gets to affirm what's happening today. You're going to promise these parents that you're going to help them to raise their children in the knowledge and love of God, their Savior. And I want you to mean that. And I want you to be able to, when kids come into the church, remember those promises, because every time we baptize a child, those promises are made. And you know, children get into messes during their lives. Children make noise in church. Children fuss and carry on and go crazy sometimes. But you promise to love them. I want to hold you to that. Can you imagine what the world would be like if we loved and prayed for children every day? We don't need prayer in schools. We need people praying for schools. We don't need children to stand up and say a prayer led by someone who has to do it under duress. But if everyone of God's people would pray for our schools every day, things would change. If we prayed for our children every day, things would change. If we loved the children of the world as if they were our own, things would change. 
So I'm going to encourage you today as we do that, as we come to that time to remember those words that you're going to speak. And I'm going to charge these parents as they come forward with their sponsors to make the promises in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you to go a little farther with that. I'm going to ask you every year on the anniversary of this day to get out that candle and light it and tell them about this day and show them the pictures and remind them that even though they didn't know what was happening, God did. And the God who was with them on that day will never fail them. They will come through the floods and the fires with their souls intact because they are loved by God. I said this is a passage from Isaiah that I want read at my funeral. Let me tell you why. When I was ordained, there were not many women clergy. There were so few that we fit around one table in a church basement. There were so few of us ordained that when one of us was ordained, all the clergy women gave them all a present. I looked at the front of mine. It was a cross. I used to wear it all the time. And it was a little cross made out of bronze, and it was painted in the front to look like stained glass, and had my initial on it, T for Terry. And there was a time I wore it all the time. I wear another cross now because I've given this one away to someone else who's got the same initial as I do. But it was a time when I wondered if I had done the right thing. I had taken a stand and I had been slammed for it. It was a stand that needed to be taken, but still I got a lot of criticism for it. And I wondered if God really needed me to do this or if God was going to ask for someone else and let me off the hook. That's when I looked at the back of the cross for the first time as I held it, because I tend to hold the cross around my neck when I pray sometimes. And I looked at the back of it, and there inscribed, barely discernible because it was not painted like the front, with the words from Isaiah, I have called you by name, you are mine. I gave that to someone who was turned down for ordination because of her sexual orientation. I gave it to her because she was turned down to be ordained, but I told her when I gave it to her, I said, you don't know how precious this is to me, but I'm going to hand it to you now because people can take away your ability to serve, but no one can take away your call. It's a monumental thing we're doing today. It's absolutely what keeps me in the ministry because every time I start to think, maybe God would let me off the hook again. Maybe someone else could do this job that's so difficult to do sometimes. Someone says, I want to be baptized, or someone says, I want my children to be baptized. And I remember all over again why I was called, why I was ordained, why I continue to do this job. Because as long as I have breath in my body, I will say to people, you are beloved of God. No matter what you've done, no matter what you can do, you're beloved of God. And through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in you, when the skies open, it's not terror and judgment that come down. It is the Holy Spirit that comes down. And the Holy Spirit is equal to any need you have. So don't think you're too sinful to be here, ever. Don't think that you've done such wrong that God cannot redeem you because God is in the business of redemption. And God will be with you no matter what you face. Every time I preach a funeral, people always want to hear the 23rd Psalm, and I say the same thing every time. I wish that faith were a magic wand. It's not. I can't wave a magic wand over anyone's head and make anything better, or my knee would feel better, and my husband would still be with me. But faith is the rod and the staff that walks you through the darkest valley you'll ever face. Faith is what will get you across the rivers so you won't be overwhelmed. Faith will get you through the fires. Faith will get you wherever you need to go. There's a hymn that I almost sang today that was from Isaiah, but it's old, and the language gets a little antiquated. But I used to go into the chapel at seminary with a friend of mine, and we would, he would play the piano, and we would sing together. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of woe shall not thee overflow, for I will be with thee thy troubles to bless and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. The soul that on Jesus still leans for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Killian and Declan, 
you are God's beloved children. The heavens are going to open this morning and the Spirit will descend upon you to confirm all that is within you. To the glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.